Judaism, a short introduction by Seth Ward. The first section is a brief introduction to shared history and literature, beliefs and practices. Students of Mordechai Kaplan often cited him as having said, Judaism is believing, behaving, and belonging. Kaplan always emphasizing that membership in the community is by far the most important. The three B's are often said to go back to Justin Martyr. Jack Neusner talked about ethos, ethics, and ethnos. What you do is ethics, feeling of community or nation is ethnos, and the ethos is the spirit or the ideas behind it that the practices and community support. A more traditional division of what Judaism is all about would focus on creation, revelation, and redemption. And these themes are in fact repeated over and over in the liturgy. On the bottom of this slide, I have a reference to a basic Judaism source sheet, basically, which has a precursor of this slideshow and a number of primary sources. It also has a chart from Wikipedia about how the Bible is divided by Jews and by various types of Christians, some primary sources, and much, much more. In this section, we'll discuss a little bit of the history. Jewish history is often said to begin with the patriarchs, Abraham, his son Isaac, and Abraham's son, I'm sorry, Abraham's grandson, Isaac's son, Jacob. In fact, the Torah, the uh, Bible, begins with creation, discusses ten generations from Adam to Noah, and ten from Noah to Abraham. Abraham is called, according to the biblical text, to travel from his birthplace north to Haran, and then in Haran he is told, or somewhere he is told at the end of chapter 11, to get out of his ancestral land and go to the land which God is about to show him, the land of Canaan. The map depicts a very typical illustration of how these wanderings are to be understood. Abraham's descendants go down to Egypt according to the biblical narrative, brought there by Joseph in order to last out the famine and to share in Joseph's good fortune. Many years later, a traditional Jewish date is 1311 BCE. The Israelite descendants, now numbering an enormous amount of people, 600,000 some odd men between the age of 20 and 60, and the associated children, elders, and women. In other words, if you believe the biblical sources, some two million people went on the Exodus, stopping in front of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments uh, and to build the desert sanctuary. After 40 years of wandering, they enter the Holy Land and begin a period in which there's decentralization all the various family, kinship, and tribal groups have separate, uh, are separate entities, only coming together in the face of danger. The biblical narrative suggests that the people wanted to have a king, and approximately 1040, 1020, something like that BCE, uh, according to the traditional quasi-scientific dating, they prevailed upon Samuel, a a judge and prophet to appoint Saul as king. Saul was succeeded by King David who founded the city of Jerusalem or more exactly conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. It's depicted on the lower left hand corner of the slide. Rebuilt the city, united the southern and the northern tribes for a period of time, preserved them from the Philistines, and under David's son, the first temple was built. Traditional date might be 960 BCE.
The divided monarchy did not survive very long after Solomon's death, according to the traditional story. We have a kind of secure date in that we have an advance of the pharaoh from Egypt in 925, uh, which corresponds with material that's in the Bible, in the Book of Kings, about that uh, attack. So we have one of our earliest really firm dates. From that time, the northern kingdom was probably the larger one and more important one most of the time. However, it was destroyed in 721 BCE by the Assyrians. The Judean kingdom, the southern kingdom expanded, took over some of the land and some of the sites that were sacred in the northern kingdom, Bethel and a number of other places, at least the southern part of the kingdom of Israel were Judean. King Josiah centralized the liturgy at the temple, but the temple was destroyed in 586 BCE, bringing to an end first temple times. The second temple was dedicated 516 BCE. After the fall of the first temple, the Judeans had been exiled to uh, uh, Babylonia. In fact, some of the leaders had been exiled a decade or so before the Babylonians destroyed the temple. Not many of the Judeans returned to the land of Israel, and the community was small for many, many centuries. The period from 516 to 330 or so is considered to be the Persian period. And during this period, the uh, type of biblical production that we call prophecy came to an end. The last prophets uh, were Malachi and some of his contemporaries who are dated anywhere to the time when the, first, the second temple was built to the middle of the 450s or so. The Judeans lived peacefully, more or less, under the Hellenistic period, the successors of Alexander the Great, until in the 160s and 170s BCE, the um, Seleucid Emperor Antiochus IV, usually called Antiochus by Jews, installed a regime in which he would place an idol in the temple, prohibit certain Jewish uh, observances encourage Jews to eat pork and in other ways become just like everybody around them. In fact, many Judeans were assimilationists or Hellenizers. But the pietists, those who were not enthusiastic about assimilating to Greek society, Greek Hellenistic society, mounted a revolt and reestablished pietist control of the temple in 167 BCE. The Hasmonean dynasty, the dynasty set up by the Maccabean revolt, lasted until the time of Herod in the 30s or so BCE. Herod died at 4 BCE. During the period we just discussed, the basic religious text of Judaism came to be, and the period of the creation of these basic texts and extended to the end of late antiquity. During the period of time that I've called the Hasmonean and Herodian age, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are scrolls that were found in caves along the Dead Sea from 200 BCE onward, probably until about the Christian era. These scrolls include almost all of the books of the Bible, the book of Esther is not found, and one or two books that were probably considered to be what today we would call biblical or part of the biblical canon, such as the book of Jubilees. Uh, they were found in Hebrew and some of them were found with Aramaic or Greek versions. Uh, during the Herodian period, we have the beginning of the deliberations of what came to be known as the Mishnah. The Mishnah is in the form of short statements about laws. For example, it begins, as in the image on your right, uh, from what time in the evening should we recite the evening Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and following, and a few other paragraphs that were added to it over the centuries. 
It gives four answers by rabbis, and then there is a discussion called Talmud about exactly what those different opinions mean. Are they really different at all? Do they uh, differ on major things like the actual time, or simply what happens if you don't get around to it during the time that you should have? Uh, the Mishnah and those discussions, the discussions themselves are called Gemara Learning or Talmud, and uh, they were put together in a book called the Talmud. There are two of them, one in uh, called the Jerusalem Talmud, the Palestinian Talmud, which reached written form in the 500s or the 400s, and the Babylonian Talmud, which reached its written form in the five or six hundreds in the Christian era. Alongside the development of Talmud, we also have Midrash. The Mishnah goes in the order of the type of law, agricultural law, or uh, laws having to do with family status, or with holidays, or with uh, civil obligations, or with various temple practices. Whereas the Midrash goes along in the order of uh, biblical texts. During the uh, Dead Sea Scroll period, the ha uh, Herodian, the Hasmoneans, and then Herod the Great, who ruled from 36 BCE to 4 BCE, uh, they were in power, uh, and the Romans conquered the land of Israel in the 60s BCE. And the Romans really were ultimate power. It was they, for example, the Roman Senate, who confirmed that Herod should be uh, the king, and they determined how his sons would split up the kingdom after his death in 4 BCE. The Roman period lasted to the Islamic conquest, but we generally call the period from the 3rd century on, I'm sorry, the 300s on, the 4th century on, the Byzantine period, because the Roman Empire split under Constantine. Uh, there was an Eastern and a Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Empire was headquartered in Byzantium, and the city that was called Constantinople, and uh, in the 20th century, Istanbul. Uh, the Byzantine period uh, saw the growing importance of Christianity in that area. The Byzantines were dominant, although quite clearly we have uh, synagogues, large and luxurious synagogues with very expensive mosaics, such as the one you see on the lower left-hand corner from the synagogue in Beit Alpha. Uh, all through this period, uh, perhaps beginning to fall away in the uh, 600s or late 500s, right before the Islamic conquest. The Islamic conquest occurred in the 630s and 640s, um, Battle of Gaza, the Battle of the Armagh Valley, and so on. Uh, but along at the same time, there were physical uh, weather or um, uh, issues. There was a famine, there were floods, there was um, an earthquake, and there was also a lot of fighting. The Byzantines and the Persians had been fighting off and on. Jerusalem was conquered by the Persians in 615, and... Uh, the area reverted to the Byzantines in 627. Um, we find that in the decades following the Islamic conquest, there was an awful lot of abandonment of some of the smaller cities and villages, and the general population probably not merely converted to Islam, but also probably was lower than it had been before. I'm adding the second Jewish revolt over here. I should uh, mention that the first Jewish revolt was the one that led to the destruction of the temple, but the second Jewish revolt probably had more important ramifications. This was under Bar Kokhba. It was in, concluded by, in, by 135, and the Romans uh, worked very hard. It was a very, very serious rebellion. And as a result, the Romans uh, built a, a temple to Jupiter, according to tradition, in Jerusalem to replace the site of the temple, which had been left in ruins, and uh, also exiled many of the uh, Judeans from that area. The next period of time is medieval times. The statue on the right-hand side is a statue of Maimonides in Cordoba in uh, Spain. 
In early medieval times, the center of Jewish life was still in Babylonia, as it had been in late antiquity, in the 4th and 5th and 6th century, as the uh, settlement in Judea, and even after the uh, Bar Kokhba rebellion, the center uh, in Judea and in Galilee had begun to decline a little bit, the center in Babylonia thrived. In medieval times, in the period from the 600s to about the 900s, the Geonim, the teachers in the Talmudic academies in Babylonian, were successful in making the Babylonian Talmud the normative source for Judaism. Their version of the calendar seems to have uh, succeeded during that period of time. They created satellite schools in various places, and uh, a new book in Judaism. There had been prayers since the destruction of the temple, uh, at least, but they had never really been gathered into a single book. There was a question that was sent to one of the Geonim, uh, asking, well, you know, we're supposed to bless God a hundred times a day. Can you give me the texts for the blessings and the order? And this was the generation of what today we would call the prayer book in Hebrew, Sidur. The centers were found in Ashkenaz, or the Rhineland, in North Africa, in Egypt, in Palestine, and in Spain. Spain came to be called Sepharad. Maimonides may very well be the most important personage from this period. He was born in 1135 or 1138. He died in 1204. His major works are the Code of Jewish Law, a book he called the Mishneh Torah, and he argued that you could read the Bible and read his Mishneh Torah, and you'd know not simply all of Jewish law, but all of the oral Torah, all of the oral tradition about what needed to be studied. Uh, he, Before he wrote the Code of Jewish Law, he wrote a lengthy commentary on the Mishnah, and some of the ideas in the commentary of the Mishnah uh, bring together disparate pa parts of Jewish law or Jewish thought. The most important parts of the commentary in the Mishnah today are his introduction to the entire commentary, his introduction to Tractate Avot, in which he talks a lot about things like speech and philosophy and so on. It's called Shmona Prakim, the eight chapters, and especially his introduction to Perak Helek, the tenth chapter in the Tractate Sanhedrin, uh, which has the 13 principles of Judaism, which we will see in a moment. His final major work is a book called The Guide of the Perplexed. He wrote this in Arabic as he wrote the commentary of Mishnah in Arabic, in Hebrew characters, albeit. Code of Jewish Law was written in Hebrew. The Guide of the Perplexed deals with philosophers who are committed to a philosophic approach and perplexed as to how to understand religious texts in the light of scientific truth as they understood it. Still a very important book. Jewish communities grew throughout Europe in the 900s, thousands, and so on, and centers emerged, especially in the Rhineland. They spread to Britain and France and Germany, and especially with expulsions from France in the 14th century and from some of the principalities in what we would call today Germany, uh, all during this period, there began to be a kind of migra migration towards the east. Spain, the Jewish community, lived both under the Muslim and the Christian societies, flourishing uh, for most of this period, although after the 1300 or so, pressure in Christian Spain began to increase. In 1391, there were uh, spontaneous uh, demonstrations. They weren't really spontaneous. They were encouraged by the, uh, some of the priests. Uh, there were demonstrations against the Jews throughout Spain. They were forced to hear sermons, and many of them lived openly as Catholics, although they secretly kept to their ancestral religion. In 1492, Jews were expelled from Spain. Uh, Jews were not allowed to remain in Spain. Many converted, many moved to Portugal, uh, many left. The Jews who moved to Portugal were forcibly converted in 1497. In 
classic times, we had in ancient times, classical age, we had uh, various types of uh, varieties of Judaism. Uh, there was the Judaism of the uh, Sadducean priests, there the Pharisaic Judaism, and we don't really have many records to be able to tell us about all the different varieties of Judaism. There's an awful lot of speculation. With the imposition of Talmudic Judaism in the Middle Ages, we had non-Talmudic Judaism called Karaism. Uh, they often had the same kind of approach that the Talmudic Jews did, except they didn't accept the authority of the Geonim to rule what the answer would be and what the rule would be. Uh, among the more traditional Jews, though, you had various approaches to what was ultimately important. Some were philosophers and rationalists. Some developed a more halachic, more legal. La halacha is a Hebrew word that in this context means Jewish law. And some were interested in what we would call Jewish mysticism, developing a system called Kabbalah. And you can see an example on the right-hand side of the Kabbalistic tree. The expulsion from Spain probably is the best marker for the beginning of early modern times. That was in 1492. As I said, many Jews left. It's not easy to determine how many. There are all sorts of numbers that are out there. At about the same time, we had a number of other things happening. There was a growth in shipbuilding. This was the age of international exploration. Columbus discovered America. Portuguese sailors went uh, to South Africa and on to India. Sailors from Venice made it easier to go from Venice to the Holy Land, and the land of Israel had the Jewish community grow uh, with many, many migrants, Jewish migrants from uh, Europe. The Ottoman Empire conquered this area in 1517, and Jerusalem and Safed grew exponentially under Ottoman control. In the 1600s, there was a growth of Jewish communities, both in what today would be the United States. The first Jews came to New York in 1654. Great Britain allowed uh, the England, allowed Jews back into England in the mid 1600s. Uh, this was during the time of Oliver Cromwell. One more piece at this time. It's very important to mention the mystic movement of Shabtai Tzvi. As you may recall, Kabbalah grew up as one of the, you might say, varieties of approaches to Judaism in the latter Middle Ages. Kabbalah, we use as a term to talk about all Jewish mysticism, but also reflects a specific system with the ten sefirot that I showed you in the previous slide. In Safed especially, there was a growth of a very important Kabbalistic center, uh, the major figure there, or one of the major figures, was uh, Isaac Luria, an Ashkenazi Jew, born in Jerusalem, educated in Cairo, and lived the last few years of his life in Safed. The uh, Rabbi Luria is always called the Ari, and uh, he that means Ashkenazi Rabbi uh, uh, Isaac, Isaac Luria. And the disciples of his disciples included uh, a very interesting mystical messianic figure, Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi uh, preached the um, redemption of Judaism both through observance of commandments but also through breaking commandments, had a number of other very strange ideas. He and his disciples were very creative in terms of ritual and uh, some of the rituals were completely forgotten. Uh, probably it's a good thing too, but uh, some of the rituals had lasting impact in even in normative Judaism. His movement was one of the last movements to go worldwide before the Zionist movement. Shabtai Tzvi was brought before the Ottoman Empire uh, emperor in the 1600s and offered a choice basically to perform a miracle to have his head reconnect with his body after being severed, or to uh, become a Muslim. He became a Muslim in 1666. Some of his followers followed him into Islam, and I think a very interesting movement, the Dunman movement, for a couple of centuries. Uh, Sabbateans continued to be involved in Jewish life 
for a century or two or three. And as I said, some of the ideas about liturgical creativity continued for quite some time. The early modern period stretches to the late 1700s or very early um, 1800s. Uh, there was the beginning of the liberation of Jews in Europe already before the time of Napoleon. Napoleon, the beginning of the 19th century, convened the Sanhedrin, sent them some very important questions, all of which were about having the Jews function as Frenchmen of the Jewish religion rather than a kind of Jewish national group that happened to be subject to the French crown. Uh, so they affirmed that they would accept French law, they, uh, for, at least for civil and governmental and political matters, uh, that they would uh, allow religious law to be interpreted in ways that were consistent with that. All during this period, it became much easier for Jews to assimilate to the surrounding culture. Uh, in the Middle Ages, even in the beginning of early modern times, it was very difficult for Jews to be uh, invisible, as it were, to pass as Christians in Europe or in areas under Islamic rule. That changed in the 1700s and especially in the 1800s. And we have the emergence of a reform movement in Germany first and later on in the United States and in other places in the 1800s, which attempted to uh, reform Judaism to be more in line with the ideally ideology and the life and the times. They had their sermons in the local language. They sat in uh, rows that were similar to those of the churches that were around them. The ministers wore garb that was similar to the garb of some of the Christian ministers. They never wore the uh, clerical collar. Uh, but they might have worn the robes and the hats and so on that were similar to the, those worn by ministers. Another feature of modern times were phenomenally important demographic shifts. Already in the beginning of modern times, we have not merely the migration out of Spain to places like Italy in the, and what today is Greece and the land of Israel uh, in the Ottoman Empire, and uh, former Jews who had returned to Judaism also flocked to places like London and Amsterdam and the New World. Sometimes these are called Western Sephardim or Spanish Portuguese. These are Jews who converted, whose ancestors converted to Judaism, retained some sort of an identity, and when they were able to, they began to move out of Spain to other places, either in the Spanish Empire of the New World or in places that were open to their migration in Europe and elsewhere. You also had expulsions from some of the principalities in Germany and a very open environment in the Kingdom of Poland, which was much larger in the early modern times than it uh, came to be. By the end of the 1700s, Poland disappeared gobbled up by Prussia, Austria, and Russia. A second period of mass migrations was started, we have to say, really in a slow way in the 1840s and then in a very large way in the 1880s. In the 1840s, Jews who lived in parts of Germany participated in some of the migrations that brought non-Jews from Germany to America and to other places. In the 1880s, uh, after some uh, pogroms in uh, Russia and the unsettled situation in uh, the Tsarist Empire, there was a mass migration of enormous, enormous Jewish community there. Most of the areas where Jews had lived in what was the Tsarist Empire at that time had actually been part of the Kingdom of Poland up to the late 18th centuries, they said up to the late 1700s. The migrations went to Western Europe, they went to the United States, a small number of them as a percentage went to the land of Israel. Uh, Four million uh, Jews left what was the uh, Tsarist Empire between 1880 and 1920. 
We talked briefly about the Reform Movement, a way to have a kind of modern Judaism that was very much like the religions of the neighbors, uh, Protestantism for the most part. But there were also other kinds of movements that were not particularly religious. There was the idea of assimilating into the surrounding culture, into the surrounding secular culture. Uh, there was an idea of socialism, the idea um, Karl Marx and others uh, had had that uh, social control, the workers of the world unite in the um, communist ideas, um, but that there would be different ways of ordering society that would allow for uh, unity of all people, Jews as well as non-Jews. Many Jews believed that movement to the uh, land of Israel was the answer. The name Zionism was coined already in uh, before a decade or so before the time of Herzl's uh, manifesto, the Jewish state. Um, but at the very end of the 19th century, this also was seen as a solution to the Jewish problem. So we had migration to America, we had socialism as a cure, we had reform movement, we had the idea of total assimilation. We also have to note the development of a very secular literature. During this period of time, Jews began to create much more than they had before, a literature that aspired to be like all world literature, even if it was written in uh, Yiddish, but certainly they also wrote in Russian and English and so on, um, and uh, aspired to be part of the same literary traditions as their neighbors. The most important events of the 20th century have to be the Holocaust in 1933 and 1945, 1933, the rise of National Socialism to power, 1940 and 1941, we have the beginning of World War II, and 1942, the uh, beginnings of the implementation of the Endlosung, the final solution, and the end of the war in 1945, the liberation of the death camps and the concentration camps. Alongside that, also, the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, there is a long history for that as well. Uh, we've already had uh, migration, uh, especially modern secular migration, in the 19th century, in the 1800s. The Balfour Declaration recognized that the Britain looked at the... Um, uh, one of the goals of World War I, you might say, would be to look with favor, to view with favor on the establishment of a Jewish national home in that area. They stopped short of saying a sovereign state. Alongside the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, we need to think about the Six-Day War in 1967, in which the State of Israel came to control areas that had been annexed by Jordan or administered by Egypt uh, and areas that had always been part of Syria. And the 1967 situation changed the dynamic of all the discussions about the State of Israel ever since. Uh, there was a war in 1973, it's called the Yom Kippur War. That war was one in which the Egyptians were one of the leaders, and Syrians also participated, the Jordanians did not. The Egyptians and the Syrians were trounced militarily, but their initial success made it possible for Egypt to sue for peace, or I should say Egypt and Israel to create a peace a situation. And since 1979, Egypt and Israel have been at peace. Two more events in the 20th century are worthy of very brief discussion. Uh, the 1960s was a great period of change in the United States in the status of women and the rise of the uh, feminist movement and so on. And it reached, you might say, the American rabbinate in the 1970s. In the 1970s, first the reform and then the conservative and reconstructionist uh, movements admitted women to the rabbinate and uh, women began to serve uh, as rabbis and spiritual leaders uh, broadly. The Orthodox movement still does not ordain women officially. There are a small number of Orthodox rabbis 
who call what they do ordination of women, and there certainly are many women who are studying the same material that men study for the rabbinate in the Orthodox movement. The final thing to mention is that for many years, for many centuries, since the Russian Empire gobbled up the uh, Polish Kingdom and a number of other areas which had had large Jewish communities in Ukraine and Romania and so on, the Tsarist Empire and then the Soviet Union had been a very large center for Jewish life, although Jewish life was constrained under the Tsars and the atheistic approach of the Soviet Union made Jewish life even more difficult. Uh, between 1989 and 1991, the Soviet Union crumbled, officially being dissolved in 1991. That change has led to another migration of Jews from the forward, former Soviet Union to Europe, to Israel, to, a, to the United States, and also a rebirth of Jewish life in the Soviet Union. The ramifications long term are still hard to assess, but for two or three decades, and it hasn't really been uh, very long since 1991, uh, for several decades, the energy of the Russian migrants and the energy of Russians in, I should say, in other people in the former uh, uh, communist bloc to create a rebirth of Judaism has been an important theme. Uh, 1991 to 2015. Looking back, say 20 years, it will be hard to know whether it continues to be uh, as important. Here I have a brief summary talking about the ancient period. We talked about the patriarchs, about the exodus, about the judges, and the Davidic kingdom. All of these are described in biblical material. We have very, very little other material. The archaeology is somewhat ambiguous and certainly capable of dis to be discussed one way or the other. Uh, from some point in First Temple times, we can talk about the divided monarchy. We have great archaeological evidence. We also have corresponding historical material from Egypt and from the uh, Babylonian and Assyrian empires. The first temple was destroyed in 586. The second temple lasted from 516 BCE to 70 CE. We talked about the early part of the second temple, the Persian and the Greek periods. We talked about the Hasmonean, the Maccabees, and the Herodian periods, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the beginning of the emergence of uh, the Mishnah, and the late antiquity, we have the uh, Talmud, the Mishnah, emerging to written form. We have the Talmud, and we have many of the basic practices known from this rabbinic period. The early ancient period, one could say, comes to a close with the Islamic conquest. In the medieval times, we have the rise of centers, especially in Babylonia at the beginning, and then we have in Ashkenaz, Germany, and Svarad, Spain, and elsewhere. We have the writing of law codes that codify the laws in the Talmud. We have commentaries on the Bible and the Talmud. We have the development of works on belief and the prayer book, and a full elaboration of Talmudic Judaism, which becomes normative Judaism for all practical purposes. The modern period starts with the early modern period in the uh, with the expulsion from Spain in 1492, and you might say the modern period with the time of the beginnings of emancipation in Austria and especially the Napoleonic period in the very late 19th, a very, very late 18th and early 19th centuries. And we talk briefly about changes in patterns of practice and large demographic change. <sighs> In covering the contemporary period, the 20th and the 21st century, I didn't mention the rise of anti-Semitism earlier. I'll come back to that in a moment. We did talk about the Holocaust and the State of Israel and new roles for women. We'd mentioned very briefly the emergence of Orthodox conservative reforms, starting from the reform movements in Germany already in the 1800s. And we talked a little bit about secular uh, Judaism and about the ability to be involved in general society and modern life. Anti-Semitism is a term that was coined in 
the 1870s by Wilhelm Marr, a newspaper uh, journalist and uh, activist in what today would be Germany, to refer to parties that objected to the involvement of Jews in the emerging nation-state that would become known as Germany out of the uh, Prussian Empire. Anti-Semitism had its parallel in France, and the Dreyfus trial uh, perhaps is a ramification or a manifestation of anti-Jewish activities. Dreyfus was a captain in the French army and accused of spying for Prussia. Uh, the trial was a sham and uh, reflected on anti-Jewish sentiment that was hard to remove. Even in France, one of the paragons of enlightened, modern, egalitarian societies. Uh, it was the Dreyfus trial that showed Herzl, uh, or at least Herzl claimed as a result, that there was no solution of the Jewish problem without Jews also developing a nation state of their own. Before going on to discuss beliefs and practices, let's review the major literary components of the Jewish tradition. First of course, there is the Bible. Jews divide the Bible into the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and number the entire collection as 24 books. First and second Kings are considered to be one book. All 12 uh, shorter books of prophecy at the very end of the prophetic section are considered to be one book, and so on. The way <clears throat> the Hebrew Bible is organized uh, Malachi, the prophet Malachi Malachi, is not the end of the entire Hebrew Bible. It's the end of the prophet section. And the last, the next to last verse is repeated. And the la end of the 24 books is the end of the book of Chronicles, which talks about Cyrus's edict restoring the land of Israel to Jewish uh, settlement, at least. Alongside the Bible, we have the Mishnah and the Talmud. The Mishnah re reached written form in approximately the year 200 to 220, Christian era, CE. Uh, it has six orders. Most of the, these orders are the divisions, six divisions. Most of the Mishnahs, most of the individual paragraphs in the various texts are collections of short sayings, from what time do we recite the evening Shema, giving four opinions, or um, commandments that are oblig obligatory for the father regarding his children versus commandments regarding the children that are uh, obligatory on the children regarding their parents and discussing minor changes. All of these things are discussed in greater detail. The original Mishnah plus the discussion is called the Talmud, and there are six divisions, agriculture, seasoned women, damages, holiness, and purity. There are two, in fact, uh, collections of these discussions, the Jerusalem or Palestinian Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. Alongside the Mishnah and Talmud, there was a Midrash, the legal and literary discussion of biblical texts. The prayer book was first developed as a written, what we would call book, as a response to an inquiry that came in in Ge'anic times and has been continuously revised. Uh, the prayer book as we know it, you might say, uh, already appeared in the, about the middle of the Middle Ages, the 900s, 1000s, and so on in a number of places. Originally, there was a little bit more discussion, and people were expected to know more of the text as time went on. The texts were given in much more explicit detail. There is an idea that one should write commentary as opposed to Midrash. That developed in the Middle Ages as well. The most important commentator probably is Rashi, who lived in the Rhineland and the Champagne district, died 1105. Maimonides, was important as a commentary on the, writing a commentary on the Mishnah. We'll get to the most famous portion of that commentary in a moment. But he also codified Jewish law, or in fact, all of traditional Jewish learning. Uh, he wrote the 
code of Jewish laws. It's often translated uh, sometime around the 1160s or 70s. After, or I should say alongside Maimonides Code, we have also another code called the Shulchan Aruch, the prepared table of Rabbi Joseph Caro, who lived in Safed. He was born in Spain, part of the exiles, moved to Saloniki and other places, eventually settled in Safed in the north of what is today the state of Israel. And his, uh, he wrote a number of important books that aim to help codify or make rulings on Jewish law. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch, the prepared table, just gives the ruling, only includes the material that's of practical value today. There are many other books that were written. I am not going to take much time in our very brief review of literary components to talk about books of piety and books of mysticism and books of Kabbalah, uh, but there were many other types of literary works that we have from this period of time, from traditional Jewish uh, writings up to the present. Let's turn now to beliefs. One can classify religious beliefs as falling into believing, behaving, and belonging. This division may go back to Justin Martyr. It was often quoted by many Jewish teachers. I'm thinking primarily of uh, Mordechai Kaplan, whose students all talk about the fact that he would mention this and talk about how belonging was actually the most important thing that religion did. Well, belief is all, or in Judaism is usually belief about God, the most important one, although there are also beliefs about Torah. The Torah and the mitzvot, or commandments, are the guide for behavior. And many of the ideas about belonging are associated with the people of Israel, the land of Israel, even the language of Israel, and uh, other things that related to a sense of community. And today, a sense of community is extremely strong and occurs even in some people who have jettisoned any belief in God or practice of traditional Jewish uh, uh, rules. The 13 Articles of Faith come from Maimonides' teaching in his commentary to the Mishnah. We're going to look at them in a moment. There is a kind of tension between the various ways in which land, time, and people are considered to be holy. The idea of a sacred land, the land of Israel, a sacred time, the Sabbath and the festivals, and the sacred people, the people who do various things or don't do various things, uh, at least some of those things, as testimony to the fact that they attempt to make their lives and their people sacred. In the early 20th century, the writer Franz Rosenzweig talked about the theme of creation, revelation, and redemption as a way to understand the prayer book and much in Judaism. Themes that God creates, God reveals, and God redeems the people of Israel as a way to balance how one divides the material in Judaism is very powerful. Let's turn to the Anima Amin a poetic restatement of Moses' 13 principles. Uh, this is not the only one. In fact, a very famous alternate form is found in the poem Yigdal. Uh, the Yigdal prayer is recited at the end of many services, and there's a link here which I hope uh, will lead you to the Yigdal sung by young children. Many of you may find this familiar. The melody was adopted already in the 18th century for a hymn that was very popular in the English tradition, in the Anglican tradition, and in the Unitarian tradition because it was readopted in the 19th century in Rochester, New York for another hymn. The hymn is usually called the God of Abraham Praise. Well, the first five of the 13 principles have to do with God. God created everything. God is one. God is incorporeal, not a body. God is not anything to do with the physicality. God is uh, preceding the world. In the Anima Amin, God is the first and the last. 
Maimonides didn't necessarily express it in quite the same way, although his uh, personal manuscript, you might say, the second edition of the commentary, which was discovered in his archives uh, in, the, in Cairo, uh, indicates that he clarified his belief to be closer to the traditional Jewish expression. In any case, medieval physics generally believed that things that came into being would also cease to be, and that the material world had a start and will have an end, and that only God would be outside of that. Finally, in the fifth, um, in the fifth principle, uh, this is the prohibition of idolatry. Maimonides writes in a number of places that this may very well be the most important goal of uh, Jewish belief. In the Anima Amin, it's expressed, only God is to be worshipped, nothing other than God is to be worshipped. 6, 7, 8, and 9 are about revelation. First of all, the words of the prophets. Second of all, Moses is the best of the prophets, the chief of the prophets, and in his commentary on the Mishnah, Maimonides actually goes into detail with a number of arguments about why this might be. Finally, Maimonides lays out that the Torah that we now have is the same as what we always had, and this Torah is unchangeable. One could say this is a polemic against ideas, maybe say of Christians who added to the Torah, or others who may have had alternative versions and may have changed it and so on. In any case, it was important for Maimonides to lay out as a philosopher these four principles. There is such a thing as prophecy. Moses is the most important prophet. The Torah that we have is the original one. The Torah will not be changed. All these together guarantee the idea that Jewish practice grounded in Torah um, is in fact part of Jewish belief. The remaining principles have to do primarily with reward and punishment. The Creator knows every deed of human beings. The Creator rewards and punishes uh, human beings. The Creator will bring the Messiah, or I should say, I believe in the coming of the Messiah is the way that the Anima Amin uh, phrases it, and in the revival of the dead. In the context of the commentary of the Mishnah, Maimonides writes about the idea of the revival of the dead and the whole idea of what the world to come will be and encourages his readers not to worry too much about the specifics. We all like to speculate what it will be like, but he says it's far more important to work on your intellectual and moral perfection. A good philosopher, this is how he talks about it on being the best you can be, both in terms of your thinking and in terms of your acting. The commentary of the Mishnah is in fact, or I should say this passage, the 13 principles, is placed in the commentary of the Mishnah, in fact in a passage in the Tractate Sanhedrin, which talks about all Israel having a place in the world to come, except for, and there are certain beliefs that one, uh, if one denies these beliefs, one loses one's place in the world to come. So the idea of the Messiah and the revival of the dead very much have to be part of that. In point of fact, traditional Jewish belief uh, thinks about a messianic figure who will be a human being, a descendant of David, will not be in any way divine, and uh, will participate in some way that is not completely understood in the revival of the Jewish people and in the rebuilding of the temple and the reestablishment of a um, central Jewish authority in the form of a king. Uh, the revival of the dead is hotly debated, and I will, in fact, you heed Maimonides' uh, warning. It's best not to try to figure out exactly what this means, other than that Maimonides rules, uh, ruled that Jews must believe in this. What are some of the practices? Well, I'm going to start by showing you the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. 
It's not clear how early this particular text became so central to Jewish life. Perhaps it's a reflection of the Persian age where the Zoroastrians, who were dualists, were in fact so prominent. In any case, by Roman times, this clearly was an important passage. We have the famous sermon by Jesus in which he uh, quotes, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, although the Greek version has this a little bit differently. And also Numbers uh, 19, where it says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, as the two most important portion, portions of the Torah. The Shema is recited morning and evening by traditional Jews, probably more than simply the, one, the, the two times a day. It's also part of the very early morning uh, service, perhaps said the first thing at, before going, uh, first thing, as part of the first thing when you wake up, and also the last thing before you go to sleep. Traditionally, it's recited before one's death as well. Verses 7, 8, and 9 talk about a number of things having to do with Jewish education. They have to do with when you recite the Shema, uh, have to do with boxes which are worn by traditionally by men only in modern times by some women uh, that have portions of the uh, Bible, including this portion and a few others, uh, one on the arm and uh, between the, uh, just above the eyes on the forehead. <clears throat> During prayer today, although in pre-modern times they were worn uh, far longer, I'm sorry, in late antiquity they were worn for far longer than simply just for a few minutes for morning prayer. And uh, verse 9 has to do with little parchments that are uh, put in homes that usually in an ornate box which have a pa this passage on them. Alongside the recital of the Shema, you also have the study and the general study of Torah. Jack Neusner talked about the way the sages saw God was primarily through study of Torah. You also have the observance of the commandments, a midrash dating to probably the fourth century uh, maybe the third century talks about the negative and positive commandments numbering as many as 613. It should be noted that this is part of a midrash that eventually brings the number down to a much more manageable number, 11 or 5, and eventually one or two of the most important commandments. Nevertheless, the idea that there are 613 commandments somehow encoded in the books from Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy uh, won out, and there are many medieval lists and even modern lists of what these commandments are in some discussion. In terms of other rituals, I'm going to mention the importance of circumcision for boys on the eighth day of life. Uh, the new moon uh, symbolizes the importance of the Jewish calendar, the Sabbath, the importance of the Sabbath. This idea, Milah, Chodesh, Shabbat, circumcision, new moon, and Sabbath, was a kind of motto associated with the Hasmonean uprising. The Greeks had tried to change Jewish practices regarding circumcision, regarding the calendar, and even regarding the observance of the Sabbath. And uh, this is one of the earliest ideas about what is unique to Jewish practice. Achad Am, in fact, indicated and very widely quoted that even for secular Jews and Jews, had very, Jews who had very little to do with religious ideology and faith, uh, this was after a meeting in Berlin with the Berlin Synagogue, still thought that this Sabbath was important. And he remarked, more than the Jews have kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept the Jews. We mentioned that the Shema is recited in the morning and the evening, and in my elements of prayer, this is one part of the prayer. There are two other main parts of any Jewish prayer. The morning and the afternoon prayer have the formal prayer or the standing prayer. This replaces the ancient offerings that were done on the temple workday. Temple workday began with one offering in the morning and ended 
with an offering in the at late afternoon. Those were community offerings. And to remember those community offerings, there is a precentor or a leader who does not have to be a Kohen, a descendant of the ancient priests, who will lead a public recitation as long as there's a large enough community. Traditional ten, traditionally, 10 men in some, uh, well, in many, most liberal and non Orthodox congregations these days, 10 men, 10 uh, adult human, uh, men or women. The third element is the reading of the Torah. The Torah is divided into 54 portions, which are read on Sabbaths that don't correspond with a uh, biblical festival. And the Jewish year is lunar, so that sometimes there are a few more than 52, sometimes a few less than uh, 52. Uh, and then they are divided and uh, combined in various ways in order to have some of the readings occur at certain times during the Jewish year. Nevertheless, from September or October through the next September of October, the entire Bible from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy is read in order with only a few exceptions for the special holidays. In addition to the reading of the Shema, the Amida and the Torah reading, there are preliminary uh, elements and there are final elements. The rabbis quoted the idea that one should always have a preparation for prayer, so at the minimum one psalm in the afternoon service and for the morning services quite a bit more. And in the evening service, because there was no public prayer, the preparation is extremely short. And so on and so forth. Practices go beyond ritual and prayer and study to include a number of ethical precepts. <laughs> there is great Jewish interest in the idea of preventing the evil tongue. Gossip, even if it's true, if it serves no purpose, it's prohibited not by one, but by three different categories of Jewish law learned from the Bible. Jews are encouraged to give charity, both in terms of acts of loving kindness and in terms of monetary support for charity. Many synagogues will have a charity box. There is no passing of the plate on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is a sanctuary in time. No money is brought into it, you might say. But on the weekdays, there's always a charity box. In the past couple of decades, an idea uh, called tikkun olam, or repairing the world, has gained an awful lot of traction. Uh, the mystics of Safed at their head, Rabbi Isaac Luria, in the 1500s, came up with an idea that in order to have creation, God, who originally represented the totality of anything that could possibly be imagined, had to somehow as it were, restrain the divine essence. And this involved a possibility of break, I'm sorry, this involved the attempt to restrain it in vessels. No vessels could contain God and they shattered. The idea of picking up the pieces, and restoring the sparks that were released by the shattering of the vessels is a key Kabbalistic concept in Lorianic Kabbalah. In the 20th century, the idea of doing mitzvahs, doing, and here we have to translate this as good deeds rather than commandments, repair the world. One changes the entire world for the better by doing acts of charity. We'll talk very briefly about the Jewish year. First of all, we mentioned that there is a lunar calendar uh, every 29 or 30 days, uh, well, I should say a month is 29 or 30 days because the new moon on average is viewable about 29 and a half days after the previous time. A half day means we go from midday to midnight and so over time about 354, 355 days uh, would have 12 new moons readily visible. Uh, the Sabbath comes every seven days, and there's no change in that. But in order to keep the lunar months in time with the solar year, 
some years there are 354 days. It varies a tiny bit for a number of reasons, uh, having in part to do with the visibility of the moon, in part to do with keeping some of the festivals on certain days of the week. Every two or three years, the 11 or so days add up to about another month, and a 13th lunar month is added. The three biblical festivals that are mentioned in Deuteronomy, for example, and in many other places, are Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. That's what we call them today. The Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th day of the lunar month in the spring, and it is was immediately preceded by, in ancient times, a sacrifice that's called the Passover offering, and the ritual eating of the Passover offering became the Passover Seder that we know today. This festival, traditionally Jews do not eat any leavened bread or leavened bread products, and they do eat lots and lots of matzah, unleavened bread, taking the form of crackers. Uh, Passover recalls, according to the historical um, association of the holiday, the exodus from Egypt, going out of Egypt. Uh, traditionally, one will explain the Israelites didn't have to, did not have time to bake bread. Shavuot occurs 50 days after Passover. There were a number of other ways of calculating when it occurs. The Hebrew word means weeks, the Feast of Weeks. Originally, it was an agricultural festival, although it came to reflect the time when the Ten Commandments were revealed on Mount Sinai according to the development of Jewish tradition. Uh, Shavuot has uh, today probably the most popular observance in our study sessions at night. There was a Kabbalistic idea that one should study all night long and uh, say Shacharit at dawn, the morning prayer at dawn, uh, to be ready for the revelation of the Torah. The um, other practices that are occurring with Shavuot, the decorating the synagogues with green, there's a midrash that Mount Sinai burst out in uh, uh, all its greenery when the Torah was given, and there are a number of other traditions. The most important one, to my mind, um, is eating cheesecake, uh, dairy food, and especially cheesecake. Um, on Shavuot. Sukkot is the festival of booths. It's celebrated in the fall, September, early October. It's the festival of booths. Uh, in Leviticus, we read that the Israelites are commanded to dwell in booths for seven days to recall the period of time in which they dwelt in booths in the wilderness, and they are called upon to take up the uh, palm branch and the citron and two other types of branches and wave them before God. The lulav and the etrog, as it's called, are an important part of the Sukkot festival. The high holidays are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah was called the Feast of Trumpets, or one would expect the name Feast of Trumpets based on the biblical passages. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, at the beginning of the year, is the name in post-Temple times for this holiday. Rosh Hashanah, the liturgy assumes that this was the day in which the world was created and the day in which God sits in judgment on all human beings, who shall live and who shall die. The trumpet, the shofar, is blown a hundred times in many traditional Jewish synagogues on two days, the first and the second day of the festival. Ten days, or on the tenth day of the month in which Rosh Hashanah begins, is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Traditional Jews do not eat they, uh, during this day. They spend all of the day in the synagogue asking for and seeking atonement for sins. There is a public confession of sins for the sin which I have committed. And most of those things in this composition are, in fact, not sins against God, but sins against God and man by speaking ill of other people, by not speaking when we should have, or by speaking when we should not have, and so on. There are two minor holidays, Hanukkah and Purim, that play a large role in Jewish, uh, the Jewish annual cycle of the year. Hanukkah occurs in December. It, it reflects the um, holiday set up 
by the Hasmoneans to record their victory over the descendants of uh, Alexander the Great, the Greeks who were resident in Syria. It's celebrated for eight days with the lighting of the candelabrum that's always called the Hanukkah menorah. Uh, there is very little besides that that has to be done. There's a tradition of eating fried foods to remember a, a supposed miracle of the oil that lasted for eight days and um, the giving of money and today in America also gifts. Purim occurs in the uh, late winter, uh, often in March. Purim includes the reading of the Megillat Esther, the Scroll of Esther, with the story of the salvation of the Jewish people in Persia and throughout the entire Persian Empire. In modern times, with the rise of Israel, there is Israel Independence Day, which occurs usually in May, and memorials to the Holocaust they are a week before Israel Independence Day and the Memorial for Israeli Soldiers the day before Israel Independence Day. And in 1967, with the reunification of Jerusalem, the 28th day of that same month, about a week before Shavuot, was set aside as Jerusalem Day. Today, the city of Jerusalem puts on a very large party and people stream to Jerusalem from all parts of the Jewish state. So in this part about Jewish beliefs and practices, we talked about God, we talked about Torah and commandments, and we talked about not simply the land or the state of Israel, but also the people of Israel, the language of Israel, and other ways in which the community is strengthened by Jewish practice. I'm going to end this presentation by quoting the passage from the tractate Avot the ethics of the fathers. The world stands on three things, on Torah, on worship, and on deeds of kindness. They study in the action of Torah, worship of God, and deeds of loving kindness keep not only the Jewish people alive, but they redeem the Jewish people, and in fact, in the worldview of the authors of the Book of Avot, also, redeem the entire world.